Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to this video. I haven't told a spiritual experience story on YouTube in years, and I'm so excited to finally feel comfortable opening up about this aspect of my life once again. So if you're new, welcome to my channel. My name is Sarah. I'm a tarot reader, crystal healer, and cult survivor. And years and years ago, I started this channel back in 2011 to kind of talk about spiritual stuff. I was really passionate back then about things like the starseed phenomenon and some experiences I had with the Arcturians, who I consider to be my star family. I was fascinated by things like the pursuit of enlightenment and aspects of the world culture that we live in now that really repress that higher awakening from happening. And while I thought those things were wonderful, that good stuff was a little bit or a lot of it contaminated by the fact that I was also on the brink of becoming fully indoctrinated into a destructive cult. And so I was talking about these really cool, fun, spiritual things, but in all the videos I made, I was wearing a mala or, you know, a prayer bead necklace that featured a photo of a fraud who I then believed was my guru. When I escaped his cult and decided to come forward about the cult abuse in 2019, I deleted all of those old videos because I didn't want anything on my YouTube channel to potentially lead people into a trap. So I think it's a good thing that I did. It kind of cleansed my channel from the nefarious presence of a fraudulent cult leader. But at the same time, I kind of miss that stuff. I miss my video about the Arcturians. I miss my video about the conspiracy against enlightenment. I miss the stuff that I used to be so passionate about. So why did I not start talking about this stuff again as soon as I deleted the old videos? Because after escaping that cult, I became really passionate and fascinated by the world of mental health and cult exposure and deprogramming, which is basically like stripping our brains of any undue influence that makes us feel subservient to somebody else's agenda. The more I studied about that stuff, the more I started to feel ashamed of the mystic nature of my life's fascinations and the things that I really love. I am enthralled by repeat numbers and the angel number phenomenon. I'm a sucker for synchronicities. Like I love a good synchronicity story. And yet a lot of the mental health professionals and cult survivors I was listening to would delegate these things into the realm of kind of like borderline psychosis. They would talk about magical thinking as a problematic schizophrenic tendency where if people start drawing parallels between coincidental things and thinking of it as divinely orchestrated, that's like a slippery slope into mental and emotional decay. And so I started to think, well, shit, I guess all this stuff that I love is useless at best or dangerous at worst. And so while I did continue to read tarot cards and make crystal healing jewelry, I felt a little bit conflicted in what I was doing. Why is it that I love these things that can be sort of like gateways into cults or into situations that strip us of our rational thinking and our self-sovereignty? I was battling that for, I guess, the last three years since 2019, and recently I experienced a synchronicity that was so undeniably awesome that even in my space of trying to reconcile what I believe in and what I don't believe in, what's good and what's bad, what's real and what's magical thinking, 
it caused me to revisit all those amazing, wonderful events in my life that I had once cherished so deeply and accept them once again and embrace the fact that just because a bunch of people might think I'm crazy, that doesn't mean I have to think I'm crazy. Just because a bunch of people would think that this kind of stuff is a fantasy or is magical thinking or is impossible, that doesn't mean that I'm not allowed to enjoy these things as a part of my personal truth. Each of us has a unique personal truth. You may have had experiences that to you are synchronous, magical, proof of your divine mission here on earth. You might identify as a star seed, a light worker, an indigo child, a mystic, a sage, a shaman. And while other people might not resonate with that or might not get it, does that mean that it's wrong? I say, fuck no, we are who we are. If you believe you are whatever it might be, then you are that. If something really cool happens to you and your first thought is, thank you universe for giving me this cool experience, and your second thought is, nobody would believe me, that doesn't need to stop you from sharing it. You know what, so what? I feel at this point like the right people will listen to us at the right times for the right reasons. That's how we create our communities. That's how we link up. That's how we find our tribe down here in this murky, confusing, strange place that we call planet Earth. So yeah, I'm ready to talk about spirituality again. Pardon the repetition. I know I said this just a couple videos back, but I felt like kind of starting today's video with a recap of how excited I am to get back to my truth once again. So thank you from the bottom of my heart to those of you who left such wonderful supportive comments on the video I made announcing my return to spiritual subject matter. I want to read one of those comments kind of as an intro to today's story and if I'm not reading your comment, don't worry, I will get to other comments as well. And I, I invite you to leave a comment on this video. If you have a question for me or a topic you'd like me to visit, let's, let's get into that again. I used to love making videos responding to comments and answering questions. So yeah, hit me with it and let's see where it leads. In the meantime, Rebecca said on my last video, I'm a psychologist, well, sort of, a mental health counselor who also loves angel numbers and synchronicities. So glad to hear you're getting more comfortable expressing yourself, having been loosely involved in a cult myself and also involved in what I consider a cult of two at one point. I too have struggled with figuring out how to not throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. I'm still figuring out what I believe outside of my brainwashing and what aspects of spirituality are still important to me. Thanks for sharing. So yeah, thank you, Rebecca. If you're not familiar with the term cult of two, it's the kind of cult dynamic that was explored in Bad Vegan, although I think she was done an injustice by that Netflix documentary. She's not a bad person. She was a victim of a cult of two. But it's basically where a narcissist or somebody who doesn't honor and validate the feelings and experiences of another tries to kind of take over your life through manipulation, lies, guilt, and forcing you to abandon your own moral compass and your own intuition in favor of their opinion of who you should be and what you should be doing. So a cult is like a group of people who are pushed to live one person's vision of reality. A cult of two is that same exact dynamic, but with just one abuser and one victim. So Rebecca, I'm really sorry to hear that you were in a cult and in a cult of two, but I'm so grateful for the fact that you're here with me on this journey and also rediscovering what spiritual stuff is still important to you. and. I found your comment to be especially validating to know that a mental health professional also loves angel numbers and synchronicities. 
because that is kind of the permission slip I was looking for to say, you can believe in spiritual things and still also honor the importance of mental health. So that's really cool. Thank you so much for that. And so 10 minutes and eight seconds into the video, I'm finally ready to tell you the spiritual synchronicity story that led to my reawakening in the realm of it's okay to talk about this stuff. So years and years and years ago, when I was living in Vancouver, I was going through what I consider to be my spiritual awakening. I was 22 years old working at a DKNY store and my life wasn't exactly what a person might think of as spiritual. I had like a very looks oriented kind of a high pressure sales retail job. I was living in a codependent relationship with somebody. We would go party every weekend. It was kind of a rave scene lifestyle. And I didn't really dedicate much time to the exploration of the higher realms. And the reason I'm saying this is that I don't want you to think of me as having been somebody who always meditated every day and did regular yoga and read spiritual books. I was intrigued by that kind of stuff. But I wasn't exactly living that lifestyle yet. And one thing that really profoundly shifted in my life was that I started wearing Moldavite every day. And I read up about the properties of Moldavite, that it's a spiritual catalyst of transformation, that things that are not resonant in our lives will kind of melt away when we start invoking its energy and that it can also spark a prevalence of synchronicities. And so kind of the only spiritual thing that I did back then was collect crystals and work with crystals. And one of the reasons I believe so strongly in the power of gemstones, minerals, jewels, crystals for sparking our higher awareness is that for me, they kind of worked through osmosis. I didn't have to try too hard to make things happen spiritually. I just surrounded myself with the minerals that had messages that resonated with what I wanted. So, okay, I get my Moldavite, I start wearing it, crazy cool stuff starts happening almost immediately. I'll, I've done enough videos about Moldavite that I think those stories are already out there. But one of the crazy cool things that happened when I started working with Moldavite is one night I put some under my pillow before going to sleep and had just a wild spiritual ride in my dream plane. So I had a very vivid dream. I can't say that it was a lucid dream because I didn't realize I was dreaming until I woke up, but it was remarkably vivid, photorealistic. And in the dream, I woke up in kind of a transformed version of my bedroom. And at the foot of my bed, there was a treasure chest. So I naturally got really curious, what's in this box? I opened it up and found a crystal ball. Sorry, my nose is dripping. I think the direct sunlight coming in. I'm sorry, I'm trying to angle myself so that the sunlight's not too distracting, but okay. So I pulled a crystal ball out of that box and gazed into it and saw a reflection of my third eye. And in the dream, I had the kind of black cat's eye eyeliner that I've kind of made my statement makeup look. I've always had that in my dreams and visions, by the way. That's why I feel like it's important to wear it. And as I was gazing at the reflection of my third eye, the scene inside the crystal ball shifted to a scene of Stonehenge from above. And when I say it was photorealistic, it was like, it wasn't like looking at a reflection of Stonehenge on the surface of the crystal or, you know, looking at a little miniature version of Stonehenge. It's like that crystal ball was a portal to Stonehenge. It, it was that vivid, that realistic. 
And at that time in my life, I had never yet been there physically. So it was very, very strange to see it. And as I was gazing at the scene, gr groups of people, like two streams of people wearing brown robes, carrying candles under the starlight, started doing this like intertwining dance where they were going around the megalith stones of Stonehenge, weaving in and out like these two ribbons of people, kind of like a DNA strand. So looking down on them through this crystal ball, they looked like they were deliberately forming two lines of people in the shape of a double helix going around that stone circle formation. So anyway, really, really crazy dream to have. When I woke up in the morning, the vision of that dream was still really heavy on my mind. Like I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was so freaking cool. And at the end of my work day, on my way home, I decided to pop into a used bookstore that was on Main Street and Broadway called Wet Wizard Used Books. I wish they were still open in Vancouver because I would love to give them a shout out, but the store sadly closed years ago. Anyway, I had this thing that I used to do when I would go to Wet Wizard Used Books, and it was a form of divination that some people call bibliomancy, where without planning which book you're going to look at or what you're going to read or what you're looking for, you just take the first book that kind of calls out to you, open it to a random page, and read. So I did that, and the book that I randomly pulled off the shelf was Star Signs by Linda Goodman. You can see it's a very beaten up dog-eared copy, but I love it so much. And the page I opened it to, shoot, I should have been more prepared and had it here for you. Ah, The page I opened it to was a poem that she had written that described what I saw in my vision. So bear with me because I want to read you the line that I read. Here we go. So she wrote, those reflections of Stonehenge where the watchful third eye can see the faint still flickering lights of the Druid's enchanted Twelfth Night Rites. So okay, she didn't say you see a reflection of your third eye in a crystal ball and that leads to a miniature of Stonehenge with robes, robe clad monks weaving in a double helix, but she did say those reflections of Stonehenge where the watchful third eye can see the faint still flickering light. So she does talk about the reflection of a third eye. Anyway, just opening to a random page and reading that random passage the day after I had that dream of seeing Stonehenge in a crystal ball through a reflection of my third eye. I was like, okay, this is a book I meant to read. That's what I mean when I say a synchronicity so coincidental that you can't ignore the fact that there's some divine hand at play or there's some planning involved in the happening that you yourself couldn't have possibly planned. I loved this experience because it showed me there's an interconnection or a relationship between the mystical visionary things we see in our dreams and the physical reality surrounding us in the world. This book was written decades before I had that dream. This book was on the shelf of that secondhand bookstore just a few blocks from my apartment at the time, just waiting to reveal this little message for me to let me know, hey, that dream you had, more than just a dream, think about it. Anyway, so I read the book cover to cover multiple times back then and always enjoyed it. There are things in it that strike me as strongly resonant and strongly true. There are also things in it that don't resonate with me. And I think that this is important to say because sometimes when we are on the spiritual path, when we feel divinely led to something, whether that be a spiritual teacher, a spiritual book, a deck of oracle cards, whatever it might be, 
we might feel that because a spiritual experience led us to something, we have to accept everything about it. But in this third density earthly world, that's not true. As long as somebody is a human being, they have good qualities and bad qualities. There's stuff that might be totally tapped into divine frequency where they're channeling nothing but pure truth. And then there might be the human personality that comes through every now again and misinterprets shit. So I want to say that kind of as like a disclaimer, not every single thing in every single spiritual book that we love is necessary for us or has to resonate. You don't have to accept everything. For example, if you watch one of my tarot reading videos and you're like, yeah, a lot of what she said makes sense to my situation, but some of it doesn't resonate, drop what doesn't resonate. Like always check in with yourself as your personal North Star of truth. Anyway, that said, I loved this book. I loved most of what was written in this book. All really, really cool. And then I got sucked into a cult and was forced to let go of everything that didn't originate from that cult leader. So we weren't allowed to read spiritual books written by spiritual authors other than the books written by his disciples that he claimed he wrote. So we had to be singularly, obediently, devotionally surrendered to him and only him. So over the years, I kind of forgot about Star Signs by Linda Goodman. Let's back it up to October 28th of this year. I got the confirmation from one of the producers at Dr. Phil that I was going to be on the show and that they were going to fly me to Los Angeles on the 30th and I would have a night in a hotel and then the next day I'd be on his show. So that's all cool. The hotel where they were going to put me up was originally going to be at Universal Studios. And, you know, about an hour later, the producer sent me a message to say, hey, just a heads up, there's one small change in your itinerary. Instead of Universal Studios, you will be staying at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. And something told me this is significant. Like, why do I feel like the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel has meaning to it? So I Googled it and found all kinds of really interesting information about the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel online, like Marilyn Monroe had lived there for some time and, you know, famous people stayed there. And I've never really been that fascinated by the world of Hollywood, so... It was kind of like, okay, well, that's all interesting, but I still felt like there was something more to it than that. So I kept Googling, like, what's the history of the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel? Like, what's so significant? And among other things, I found the thing that for me makes this a synchronicity story. And that is that Linda Goodman wrote three of her books in the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Sun signs, love signs, and my ultimate favorite, star signs. And then it hit me like, oh my God, this is why this is happening. I had pushed away, forgotten about, disregarded, gaslit myself into ignoring all the amazing synchronicities and spiritual things that had happened in my life. And suddenly, a situation was created that would bring me exactly to stay at the very hotel where one of the books that had most validated one of my spiritual dreams was written. So I decided to pack the book with me in my carry-on and read it on the plane and reimmerse myself into the world of Star Signs by Linda Goodman. And I understood immediately why I had been placed in that hotel instead of the Universal Studios. And that is that in the very introduction to her book, Linda Goodman talks about cult red flags and how to navigate the world of modern spirituality and the New Age movement without falling victim to a cult. 
And so it's fascinating that all this time I had a book that had I but believed what was written in it, I could have avoided the pitfall of cult indoctrination. So she says, Beware of those glittering pseudo-wizards of Oz who promote enlightenment like used car salesmen in group seminars costing a small fortune, especially when the leaders of these programs are wealthy men who remain aloof to the individual seeker. Their wealth earned from the gullibility of their students taught by high-pressure junior salespeople. Whew. Literally what the Nityananda cult was. He is a wealthy man sitting on a golden throne, preaching about enlightenment like a used car salesman, convincing people to go to him for $15,000 programs, $21,000 programs, $200,000 donations, remaining, as Goodman puts it, aloof to the individual seeker. He doesn't care about people. People are just a means to an end for him, that end being wealth, power, dominance over other people's lives. So I'm reading this thinking, well, shit, why didn't I follow her advice and avoid getting into that cult? And then it hit me, maybe I was meant to go into that cult because somebody has to go into it who's willing to speak out against it when they leave. And that led me through the series of contemplations and considerations that suddenly brought me to the self-acceptance and the clarity that I hadn't done anything wrong by going into that cult. I did follow my intuition. I did follow the synchronicities. I allowed myself to be led into a negative situation, maybe to transmute that negativity to flip it, to take all the crap that was done to me there and become even stronger for coming out of it. Now, everything being done to current victims there is seriously wrong. I'm not saying it's okay that I recruited people there when I was still brainwashed. Obviously, I regret that and this is why I continue to speak out against it, but I've allowed myself to forgive myself for falling victim. And I think that's a really big gift that this new Linda Goodman synchronicity has had. It's also fascinating in rereading the book that she was in the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel when her spiritual teacher, who is a turban clad Indian man, knocked on her door and gave her some profound spiritual instruction that included breathwork meditation to bring her into a connection to her truth, to herself, to her life plan, to her future husband, to the place where she was going to live in a gold mining town in the old home of Nikola Tesla. Like, I can see the intertwining between the synchronicities experienced by one spiritual light in the world and in my own life, and probably you're hearing me talk about this, and I don't even know what it is that I'm saying that to you, you're thinking, whoa, I've had an experience like that too. And it's like the confirmations are giving confirmation to the confirmations, right? That to me is what synchronicities are all about. It's when we recognize the magic that's interwoven between our experiences and where our experiences overlap with the experiences of others. One of the cool passages she said in this book was about specifically the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel and that people would be drawn to that place with awakenings they are meant to have, realizations they're meant to have while they're there. And she described it as a portal place through which ideas will flow. And I just find it so fascinating and so cool that a very unexpected vessel was the vehicle through which I've had this realization. You know, I would never have thought going on Dr. Phil would bring me back into an established gratitude for synchronicities and for recognizing things that Maybe I previously would have thought a psychologist would call magical thinking and encourage me to denounce and move away from and give up on. How freaking cool that instead the experience of being on that show catalyzed for me 
the rediscovery of my personal spiritual truth. And I'm not trying to credit it to him or to his show. This happens not because of, but just thanks to being brought to LA and being put in that exact hotel. Some would say that's just a random coincidence, but to me, this is a really cool divine synchronicity. So it brought me back to the realization that things might happen in our life for a reason and that it's good to recognize that and it's fun to allow ourselves to contemplate on the mystical hand that's guiding us in life. We do have reasons to be here. We do have things that we are meant to discover, people who are brought into our lives at the right time for the right reasons, books that come to us at the right time for the right reasons, ideas, repeat numbers, sacred teachers, whatever it might be. And I'm just super excited to start talking about that stuff again. So in upcoming videos, you can expect me to retell my Arcturian awakening story. I've had enough requests for it over the years that for sure, I'm going to share that once again. I don't know if I'm going to remake my YouTube playlist called Free Yourself from the International Conspiracy Against Enlightenment, an essential 10-step program. I might do an abbreviated version of that. It was a shit ton of research I put into it way back when that I do kind of regret losing, but I might kind of re revisit that list, but with an abbreviation and an invitation to do your own research rather than just accept the stuff that I found when I was researching for it. But yeah, you can expect to hear more tarot stories from my time in the tarot room, crystal healing information from the stuff I've learned and experimented with and experienced over the years, maybe some more Moldavite videos. I've got one planned about how specifically to connect with Moldavite. And maybe let's talk about repeat numbers a bit too. Like, like I said, I feel like a kid in the candy store of spirituality once again. And I'm so happy to start talking about this stuff. So if you have a topic that intrigues you, let me know in a comment if I know anything about it, if I've had any experiences, for sure, we'll talk. If I haven't, I'll just reply to your comment and let you know this is interesting, but I don't know anything about it. I might look into it though. Like, let's not treat my videos as a discourse. Like, let's make this into a dialogue. I would love to get to know you also. If you have a cool synchronicity story, let me know in a comment. I might read it out in a future video because I feel like a lot of people are having amazing synchronicities, but they might not know to call it a synchronicity. They might not recognize it. So in the past, I used to have people comment on my videos that they love listening to my spiritual stories, but that nothing like that has ever happened to them. I just want to invite you for a moment, if you feel that way, to allow yourself to recognize the fact that you are special. You wouldn't be hearing these words if you weren't. You are special, you are divine, you are a cosmic being in a human experience. You are not a body that has a soul. You are an Atman. You are existence itself, aware of itself, and you have your body naturally existence wants to remind you of that fact. So there will be coincidences that come up in your life to remind you, hey, you're here for a reason. Hey, you're not just your face, your job, your social status, your likes and your dislikes. You are something far beyond all of that. And it's okay to be aware of it. It's not egotistical or arrogant to know for a fact that you are more than your mere social identity on earth. And when I say things will happen to you to let you know that you are more than what other people might define as you, I mean moments of synchronicity where your environment shows you a little clue, like a little bell ringing or a little birdie singing to say, hey, existence is aware of you because you are one with existence. 
What I mean by that, you might get a song stuck in your head and the next time you turn on your radio, that song is playing. You might be thinking a specific word and at that moment you hear somebody walking past you saying out loud that same word. You might have a friend pop into your head and that friend then texts you. You might look at the clock exactly at 111 or 222 or 333 or 444. You might buy something at a store and the total on your receipt comes to a sacred number that you have seen before. Those moments are synchronicities. You might have a dream of a vision of Stonehenge and then open a book to a random page that describes just that. Big synchronicities, little synchronicities, it's irrelevant how we try to quantify them. They are all the same universal frequency permeating through our physical tangible world to let us know we are more than what we might be defined as in a textbook. We are more than what society labels us. We are more than what we label ourselves. And in those moments, if we let that little bit of awe and mystery and magic take over the so-called rationality that wants to discredit anything that's not universally accepted by every single academic in academia, we might just have that little breakthrough into bliss. We're told you have to earn your right to be alive on this planet. You have to pay your rent, pay your taxes, buy things, have a marketable skill in order to be taken care of. But those synchronicities let us know that no matter what else is going on, whether we feel like successes or failures, whether we feel loved or unloved, liked or unliked, smart or stupid, no matter what, we got this. We're here for a reason. And at the end of this lifetime, we will return to the stars from which we came. And it's okay to take a deep breath and relax and be glad that we're here for a moment. And the more often we recognize those synchronicities, the more often we follow our inner guidance, the less we try to silence that voice of intuition, the more we will be ourselves and the better this life is going to get. Whether you've been abused or neglected or brainwashed in a cult, whether you've fallen for the dogmas of a society that doesn't even seem harmonious, whether you've fallen for the agendas of the food industry and ate shit that was bad for you or what, no matter what toxins we've taken in, it's never too late to go through a cleansing. It's never too late to go through a detox, whether it's mental, emotional, spiritual, or physical. I'm going through mine right now. I have taken in a lot of toxins in this lifetime. I'm releasing them once again and getting back into the flow of synchronicity. And if you are too, thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I look so forward to connecting even more. Tell me your synchronicity stories. I am a sucker for synchronicities. I want to hear them. I find it very exciting. So much love to you. Thank you for watching once again. Bye for now.